Thank you all. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. This looks good. Can you hear me? Lower. Oh, for the camera. No. Huh. Already botched my first appearance on C-SPAN. Uh, uh, I guess I'd like to first uh, uh, thank C-SPAN's Book TV for featuring my reading um, on your program, and I'd like to thank Mission Creek Festival for making me a part of the literary lineup, which is amazing, and thank Prairie Lights not only for hosting this reading, but for giving writers like me and many other people a place to write in public. Uh, much of this book was written at the, the coffee shop. American wit and wisdom began with some mass-mediated mischief. In the December 19th, seven, in the December 19th, 1732 edition of the Pennsylvania Gazette, Benjamin Franklin penned the following advertisement, quote, just published for 1733, Poor Richard, an almanac containing the lunations, eclipses, planet motions and aspects, weather, and the prediction of the death of his friend, Mr. Titan Leeds, end quote. Writing under the name Richard Saunders, he not only narrowed down the date of Leeds, uh, of Leeds' death to the date and time, October 17th, 1733 at 3.29 p.m., but also the exact moment when two worldly bodies aligned, quote, at the very instance of the conjunction of the Sun and Mercury. Franklin was a rationalist project, a product of the Enlightenment uh, who heaped scorn uh, on astrologers like Titan Leeds. More crucially, Leeds was a business rival, and the printer's way up the ladder of wealth was often achieved by stepping on his competitors. Franklin claimed that the two friends frequently debated when the cosmos had scheduled Leeds' appointments with the Grim Reaper. Quote, but at length he is inclinable to agree with my judgment, which is most exact, and a little time will tell. End quote. When Titan Leeds did not die on that date, phase two of Operation Ridicule Astrolog Astrologer kicked, in, kicked into gear. In the next Poor Richard's Almanac, Franklin slash Saunders bemoaned the fact that he couldn't attend to his best friend during the final moments on Earth. Oh, how he wished to have given Leeds a farewell embrace, close his eyes, and say goodbye one last time. This infuriated the astrologer, who ranted in his not quite posthumous 1734 Almanac about this false predictor, conceited scribbler, fool, and last but not least, liar. Poor Richard was shocked by these rude utterances. With a wearied tone, he wrote, Having received much abuse from the ghost of Titan Leeds, who pretends to still be living, and write almanacs in spite of me and my predictions, I cannot help but saying that though I take it patiently, I take it very unkindly." End quote. He added that there was absolutely no doubt that Leeds had died, for it was, quote, plain to everyone who reads the last two almanacs that no man living could or would write such damn stuff. Benjamin Franklin owned and operated the printing press that churned out his competitor's almanac, giving him a crucial advantage in this war of wor words. This inside knowledge allowed Franklin to read, uh, read his attacks, leads his attacks, uh, before they even went to press and respond to them. Quote, Mr. Leeds was too well-bred to use any man so indecently and scuriously, Franklin wrote, further egging him on. And moreover, his esteem and affection for me was extraordinary. The astrologer's protests continued to pour fuel on the fire, which by then had captivated much of the colony's reading public. Franklin kept this up for several years, and even after the astrologer really did die in 1738. Then, uh, so, for instance, the 1740 edition of Poor Richard's Almanac described a late-night visit from the ghost of Titan Leeds, who entered Richard Saunders' brain via his left nostril and, and penned the following message. I actually did die at that moment, he finally confessed, precisely at the hour you had mentioned, with just a variation of five minutes and 53 seconds. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin's ruse is the first modern, or one of the first modern examples of what I call a prank. In the groundbreaking book, Pranks, Andrea Juno and V. Vale suggest that, quote, the best pranks invoke imagination, poetic imagery, the unexpected, and a deep level of irony and social criticism. By staging these semi-serious, semi-humorous spectacles, pranksters can spark important debates and, in some instances, provoke social change. Unfortunately, the word prank is more often used today to describe stunts that make people look foolish and little more. I'm not interested in celebrating cruelty, especially the sorts of mean-spirited practical jokes, hazing rituals, and reality television deceits that are far too common in today's pop culture. 
Although good pranks sometimes do ridicule their targets, they serve a higher purpose by sowing skepticism and speaking truth to power, or at least cracking jokes that expose fissures in power's facade. A prank a day keeps the man away, I always say. <laughs> Nevertheless, I should stress at the outset that this book is not solely about pranking. Many of the characters who populate the pa these pages aren't driven by noble impulses, and even those who are, are, are more pure of heart can muddy the ethical waters with dubious tactics. So with this in mind, Pranksters examines everything from political pranks, silly hoaxes, and con games to the sorts of self-deception that fuel outland outlandish belief systems. Though these may seem like very different examples, they're linked by the fact that all varieties of deceit engender confusion, uncertainty, and ambiguity. Spectators, whether they've been scammed by a swindler or witnessed a satirical street theater performance, uh, can experience a single event in radically different ways. One person's prank can become fodder for another person's con or, as we'll soon see, conspiracy theory. Pranks, hoaxes, cons, and conspiracy theories share another key similarity. People buy into them when they resonate with their own deeply entrenched worldviews. Conversely, they can also push us to think more critically about how and why we come to embrace false beliefs, while at the same time reminding us not to repeat past mistakes. As the old proverb goes, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, though I prefer G.W. Bush's version of that. <laughs> By viewing modern history through the lens of trickery, this book offers an offbeat and overlooked account of political, religious, and social life in the West. Yes, reason and enlightenment principles shaped modernity, but so did chicanery and irrationality. Pranks also provide a real life learning lab for conducting social experiments. Anyone with enough pluck, luck, and imagination can open the hood of the culture industry's engine and watch the gears turn. One useful example is the banana hoax. In 1967, a rumor circulated that one could get high by smoking banana peels. Though, in reality, the only way to trip on a banana is to step on one. Sorry. <laughs> the instigators were most likely Country Joe McDonald and Gary Chicken Hirsch from the acid-damaged jug band Country Joe and the Fish. Um, in late 1966, they started spreading the word among friends that banana peels contained psychedelic ingredients. Even if it didn't work, Hirsch said of their druggy effects, it was great fun. End quote. Not only would this fruit be absurdly difficult to outlaw, but the thought of puffing on bananas contained more than a whiff of slapstick silliness. The story initially traveled via word of mouth, uh, and the first printed account appeared on, in a M March 1967 issue of the Berkeley Barb. Conveniently, Ed Dennison served as Country Joe's band manager and also contributed, to a regular, uh, contributed a regular music column to that underground newspaper. Quote, I was fully involved in perpetrating the hoax when I wrote that article, Denson later admitted, though he denied pinning a letter to the editor about a cop in, local food co uh, in the local food co-op who was, quote, lurking in the fresh produce section. The writer predicted that possessing large amounts of bananas would soon become a criminal offense. The smokable banana myth is a bit frivolous, sure, but we can still learn a lot from how it took root. Historian John McMillan notes that this prank reveals much about the social and media landscapes of the time. Underground newspapers created a virtual community connecting weirdos, radicals, and dropouts living in cities, suburbs, and rural areas. This alternative communication network ensured that few things remained local. Mainstream outlets also propagated this put on, starting with the San Francisco Cro uh, Chronicle in an article titled Kicks for Hippies, the Banana Turn On. Within a month, Time and Newsweek piled on with a wink, and soon it was part of popular folklore. Quote, from bananas, it's a short but shocking step to other fruits, said Congressman Frank Thompson, who cheekily proposed the uh, Banana Labeling Act of 1967. <laughs> In a speech on the floor of the House of Representatives, he declared, quote, today the cry is burn banana burn. Tomorrow, we may face strawberry smoking, dried apricot inhaling, or prune puffing. <laughs> Thompson claimed that a, quote, high official at the FDA, end quote, urged him to introduce the bill. Uh, but the Food and Drug Administration didn't actually find the banana smoking rumor very funny. In fact, they, uh, they designed various studies to...